According to Felix Frankfurter, a judge will inevitably bring to any decision-making process his whole experience, his training, his outlook, his social, intellectual and moral environment. On this basis, I should at least refer to opportunities that have shaped my thinking about the law. Our laws and some outcomes in the administration of the law are far from perfect. History, life experience and theology attest to the capacity of humans to do both great and terrible things, so it should not surprise that law should evidence this as well. Unlike science, law is not out there waiting to be discovered, mapped and harnessed. It's an arm of government and a work in progress struggling to address many intractable tasks. In contrast to most of life, the tasks of the law cannot be deferred indefinitely. If a charge is laid or a civil proceeding is launched, there must be an outcome. General theory must always yield to the praxis of a just decision in the particular. Judges may be tenured and steeped in the intricacies of the law, but they also want to live with their consciences and to sleep at night. Since trial by ordeal was abandoned almost 800 years ago, almost everyone sees the content, processes and outcomes of the law as the products of human hands. The banners outside the law library say it all. We are law in action and we are where law meets justice. This does not deny that some people involved in the law are guided by their religious beliefs at least some of the time. I suspect that many more pray for occasional divine intervention when personal interests are at stake. Tonight I want to touch on three broad topics that hopefully illustrate my theme, perhaps at the expense of denting some of law's mystique. First, I shall consider how judges inevitably and legitimately bring their personal values to the adjudicative task. Secondly, I shall touch on the psychology of human rationality to examine some particular warnings for lawyers. And thirdly, I shall say a few words about the threats to well-being posed by the psychologically dangerous places in which most lawyers study, practice and spend huge portions of their lives. The rule of law is the bedrock of a civilised democratic society. Those who exercise legislative, executive and judicial power have both the moral and legal duties to conform to law. The moral duty is reinforced by education and various oaths. The legal duty is enforced through the accountability of publicity, judicial review, appeal processes and various disciplinary mechanisms. In the 13th century, Bracton asserted that the law is the highest inheritance which the king has, for by law he and his subjects are ruled. He coined the phrase about the king being under God and the law that Sir Edward Cook took up in the 17th century when he was trying to lay down his view of the law to an absolutist monarch and when Parliament was flexing its muscles against the crown. John Adams famously spoke of a government of laws and not of men in his 1780 draft of the Constitution of Massachusetts. This really was myth, but we do know what he was getting at. Primary responsibility for maintaining, enunciating and renewing the traditions of our legal system rests on our judges, who, being neither gods nor robots, are vested with considerable discretions and choices as they go about their tasks. At a ceremony to mark his retirement from the bench, Chief Justice Spiegelman remarked, that just as the elders of the Gadigal clan of the Eora people have been the custodians of the land on which we meet, the 16 Chief Justices of New South Wales have been the custodians of the institutional traditions of the rule of law since the Supreme Court was established almost exactly 187 years ago. The rule of law is definitely not a myth or a mere slogan but we should never be fooled into believing that some invisible hand directs the judgment calls that produce legislation, common law doctrines or the outcomes of particular cases. 
History and the law reports reveal that particular values are near and dear to every jurist, even, perhaps especially, to the one who screams adherence to formalistic legalism. Some values are so widely held that they function near the surface of all legal discourse. Others may be embraced more strongly by individual judges or at particular times. Much decision making involves the application of clear norms. Many, many cases appear to decide themselves, although we shall later see that routine can bring its own dangers. Nevertheless, from time to time, judges will be presented consciously or unconsciously with choices. On these occasions, they, they will give effect to policies that they perceive to be timeless and mainstream, but which really reflect what they hold near and dear, however much they may profess to be drawing from the well of legal history. Benjamin Cardozo once observed that we may try to see things as objectively as we please, Nonetheless, we can never see them with any eyes except our own. This being the case, judges are as prone as anyone else to what I shall later identify as the heuristic or cognitive illusion of false consensus bias, whereby an individual views his or her own behaviour and attitudes as typical. Laws not administered by robots, but by men and women who bring a spectrum of attitudes about what is right and proper. These include differing attitudes about matters as diverse as human nature and its corrigibility, the lessons drawn from the past and its precedents, the significance of formal logic and rationality as against experience, the importance of conceptual order and tidiness, the proper role of the state and the scope of the private realm. Differing worldviews on these and other matters reflect themselves in how different judges approach their task and in the outcomes they bring about. The same goes for juries when they are involved. The differences tend to show up in patterns of sentencing, awards of damages, levels of suspicion or trust of government, the approach to claims by careless yet vulnerable plaintiffs, readiness to forgive breaches of procedural rules, notions of personal responsibility, touching duty of care, etc., etc., etc. Appellate processes are designed to iron out these differences as much as possible, but they'll never do so entirely, nor should they. Some matters for judicial discretion are just that. Furthermore, in our tradition, dissent is acceptable for appellate judges, some of whom see their reasoning as an appeal to the brooding spirit of the law, waiting for judges in future cases to discover its wisdom. There may be no single legally correct answer on many issues, except that which, at a given point of time, appears to be endorsed by the highest appellate court. Even then, the voices of infallibility may speak by the narrowest of majorities. Sometimes confidently asserted views may be quickly discarded in response to changes in the composition of the bench or changed felt necessities in society. The expression felt necessities is from Oliver Wendell Holmes, who famously wrote that the life of the law has not been logic, it has been experience. The felt necessities of the time, the prevalent moral and political theories, institutions of public policy avowed or unconscious, even the prejudices which judges share with their fellow men have had a good deal more to do than the syllogism in determining the rules by which men should be governed. The law cannot be dealt with as if it contained only the axioms and corollaries of a book of mathematics. Felt necessities can, of course, be misinterpreted by judges as much as by anyone else. After all, it was Holmes himself who wrote the opinion of the Supreme Court of the United States in Buck and Bell in the evening of his life. This decision upheld the right of the state of Virginia to forcibly sterilise a woman of very impaired intellect. The startling language probably reflected widely held values in 1927 and its sentiments would have delighted German national socialists. Holmes chillingly wrote this, it is better for all the world if instead of waiting to execute 
degenerate offspring for crime or to let them starve for their imbecility, society can prevent those who are manifestly unfit from continuing their kind. The principle that sustains compulsory vaccination is broad enough to cover cutting the fallopian tubes. Three generations of imbeciles are enough." End of quote. This reasoning would be swept away as the evils of the Holocaust came to light. Sir Anthony Mason remains a judicial hero of mine, particularly for his readiness to enunciate the policies lying behind his reasoning and his welcoming of the insights from overseas jurisprudence. And by overseas, I include more contemporary case law than that emanating from the English Court of Chancery that was abolished in 1875. He wrote landmark judgments about freedom of speech, the Mabo case, and of course, the famous Section 92 case already mentioned. But I've selected Sir Anthony to provide a second example of how perceptions of fundamental legal principles can shift and shift rapidly when judges lift their eyes away from the precedents and no criticisms implied in making that observation. In a 1986 judgment handed down on the day Justice Lionel Murphy died, Mason dismissed Murphy's then isolated espousal of the notion of a constitutional right of free speech with the acerbic remark that it is sufficient to say that I cannot find any basis for implying a new section 92A into the Constitution. Only six years later, Mason would lead his court to accepting that an implication of political freedom of speech truly could be found nestling in the federal Constitution, although he didn't label it 92A. By the way, Sir Anthony is, not a, is, is no relation of mine. Uh, a discovery that caused one solicitor to stop briefing me when I was at the <laughs> private bar. The individual moral and political values of our judges are most evident when the law changes direction under the leadership of an outstanding jurist. Remember Lord Atkins' application of the parable of the Good Samaritan in Donoghue and Stevenson. But they can also be evident when proposals for conceptual realignment are rebuffed by individual jurists on black letter grounds, reflective of a love of history and or formalism for its own sake. They can also surface when a body of common law doctrine swings backwards in response to some felt necessity. The Gleeson High Court moved several goalposts when shifting towards a tort law that placed a great premium on self-responsibility in key rulings about the limited duty of care owed to those playing dangerous sports, to pedestrians on footpaths and to children diving from bridges. These views tended to align with governmental concerns about the cost of insurance premiums and to, and to depart from the more paternalistic judicial attitudes of the Mason and Brennan High Courts. Once again, no criticism is intended by me either way in making these observations. Sharp divisions of opinion and shifts over the generations show that minds can honestly disagree about much in the law as with other important matters. These factors are natural and inevitable. They are not badges of ignorance or of judicial misconduct. They are badges of humanity. This should caution insiders or outsiders who launch personal attacks on particular judges or who otherwise depart from civility in intellectual and judicial discourse. Every judge is the product of his or her unique genetic makeup, upbringing, schooling, religious exposure, early professional training, and often evolving family and other circumstances. Uniformity of outcomes should surprise us more than the differences, and we must recognise that the rules of precedent exercise a significant drag effect. How much they should do so is itself a debate about the policies or values of the law. I said every judge to emphasise that this includes those who think that they do not wear their hearts on their sleeve, or who may profess total submission to Sir Owen Dixon's famous principle of strict and complete legalism. Dixon was one of our greatest Chief Justices. His learning was prodigious and his mastery of language extraordinary. And unlike some people with those gifts, he had much practical wisdom. But the researches of historians also permit us to mark him as a person of his times, 
as we all are, and a fallible human being as we all are. When Dixon told a law conference in 1955 that, quote, I do not wish it to be thought that looking in retrospect I altogether approve of what I myself did, unquote, he mentioned his decision to perform executive roles during the Second World War, functions which were quite at variance with the principles laid down in his post-war Boilermakers case decision. Dixon would not have thought of apologising for his giving covert, covert vice regal advice, uh, a very common practice uh, now forsworn by Chief Justice French. But Dixon would have been apoplectic had anyone even known of his unprofessional exploits as a ghostwriter. His personal diary reveals that he worked until 2.15 a.m. one night assisting the trial judge, Mr Justice Rich, in completing his judgment. A commendable act of charity for a High Court colleague with writer's cramp, perhaps. But it should be recorded that Dixon did not sit on the case until it came on appeal. And when he did sit, he dismissed that appeal. These were not isolated incidences either. Dixon's philosophical commitment to free market capitalism shaped his seminal decisions about the scope of sections 90 and 92 of the Constitution. On the latter front, he led a long but ultimately successful campaign in favour of an individual rights approach to the freedom of interstate trade and commerce. When his views were finally vindicated in the Privy Council in the Hughes and Vale decisions of 1955, Dixon himself composed an addendum for his reluctant colleague, Mr Justice McTiernan, which included this remark. Perhaps I may be permitted to say that I remain personally far from convinced that the result is one which the framers of Section 92 either intended or foresaw. Perceptive words. Because the High Court under Sir Anthony Mason would sweep aside the entire Dixonian dispensation in the case of Cole and Whitfield, in which, as indicated already, Professors Coper, Sackville and I played a minor part, but uh, I won't downgrade it too much, Ronald. As well as teaching here at the University of New South Wales, I'm now involved in judicial education. A couple of times each year, I present on the topic of unconscious judicial bias at the National Judicial Orientation Program. This is an, this is an intensive training course for newly appointed judges that is known in the trade as Baby Judge School. I tell the judges about a recent survey of the outcomes of applications by asylum seekers in the United States who invoke rights, I emphasise rights, stemming from reasonable fear of imprisonment, torture or death if forced to return to their home country. In America, asylum officers, immigration judges, members of the Board of Immigration Appeals and judges of the US Courts of Appeal render around 80,000 asylum decisions annually. The survey revealed some surprising disparities in the outcomes for these decisions. For example, female judges were 44% more likely to grant asylum than male. 16% of those without legal representation were successful compared to 40% of those legally represented and the longer the judge worked for the government, the lower the grant rate. In my presentation to the baby judges, I ask whether this information reveals anything of concern. Almost invariably, one of the shocked group will propose that something may be wrong with the statistics. <laughs> Others will correctly point out that some female judges are very hawkish, and some former government lawyers are liberal in attitude. When I've got these standard matters out of the way, someone invariably expresses polite concern about the deviation from the norm in the case of the judges who are female or who used to, to work for the government. He or she will do this at least until I inquire as to the grounds for implying that a male perspective or a non-governmental perspective is necessarily correct. This may push the discussion towards the topic of the representativeness of the judiciary, coupled with a recognition that the outcomes of similar cases may differ from time to time without necessarily indicating miscarriage. There may also be discussion about whether it's a good thing that the public should know about these statistical discrepancies. 
Assuming that a problem is still seen to exist, we then talk about what can be done to reduce it by way of added mechanisms for appeal and review. What the Stanford Law Review survey demonstrates is that your gender and professional background may influence your belief system and the outcome of decisions you make. Lay folk are hardly surprised, nor are those who appoint to high judicial or other offices. But some students of the law seem shocked. They should not be. Among other benefits from a truly representative judiciary is the exposure to new ideas, triggering renewal in the law, which, as I've already said, is not a self-referential corpus of mathematical formulae. Before I leave gender and the law, I note that very recently the High Court split 3-3 on the issue whether the posting of hateful messages to the families of men killed in the Afghanistan war is constitutionally protected. It was the three female members who said that it was not and who voted to dismiss the appeal, thereby allowing the criminal proceedings to go to trial. The three male justices ruled that the constitutionally implied freedom of speech required the dismissal of the charge. A fascinating thesis lies ahead for some eager student. I content myself with observing that it was an obscure provision in the Judiciary Act and not some tendency of women always getting their own way in the end that produced this outcome. Indeed, a male judge may yet have the final say in the particular matter because if Mr Monis is convicted at trial, then subject to a very nice argument about issue estoppel, he will be able to bring the constitutional issue back to the High Court now that it has returned to a full complement of seven justices, four of whom happen to be males. From time to time, a judge changes his or her mind on some factual or legal proposition. Occasionally, but rarely, retreat is precluded by rules of precedent, issue estoppel or stare decisis. Some appellate judges have been known to slide crabwise from one position to another, Others are more aware of or more honest about the process. In the 1916 decision of Duncan and Queensland, Chief Justice Griffith acknowledged that he was being inconsistent with an earlier but recent ruling of his own. That case, he said, had been badly argued by counsel <laughs> on the last day of a sitting, and the arguments that he later found conclusive, quote, did not then find entrance to my mind, unquote. Such frankness is to be applauded, although Griffith might perhaps have assumed a tad more personal responsibility. Sticking to one's guns, even when wrong, was for some Queenslanders a positive aspect of the late Sir Johanna's Jelke Peterson, but this human trait is not best practice for judges. Unless impaled on the horns of binding precedent, a judge should be able to say with Baron Bramwell that the matter does not appear to be now as it appears to have appeared to be then. <laughs> Important shifts in the law are seldom the product of logic, although proponents for change will try to expose the illogicality of the former position. Rather, these shifts will be instances of judges giving effect to insights and values that have convinced them as human beings. Naturally, rulings will have to survive appellate challenge or gain the assent of a majority in an ultimate court of appeal before they can assume the mantle of legal holy writ, at least for the time being. Discrepancies in outcome of apparently identical cases may be the product of much more mundane factors. A study was recently reported in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences in the United States. In Israel, eight judges spend entire days reviewing applications for parole. The cases are presented in random order and the judges spend little time on each, an average of six minutes. The judges take three food breaks in the morning, for lunch and an afternoon break. Overall, 35% of requests for parole are approved. The authors of the study plotted the proportion of approved requests against the time since the last food break. The proportion spikes after each meal when about 65% of requests are granted. During the two hours or so until the judge's next feeding, the approval rate drops steadily <laughs> to about zero before the meal. 
As you might expect, this is an unwelcome result, and the authors carefully checked many alternative explanations. The best possible account of the data provided bad news, namely, tired and hungry judges tend to fall back on the easier default position of denying requests for parole. Both fatigue and hunger probably played a role. This survey tends to support the legal realist caricature that justice is what the judge ate for breakfast. It certainly shows that mood swings, however induced, can impact on decision making by judges and juries. It also confirms that when judges make repeated rulings, they show an increased tendency to favour the status quo. I'm not sure what this means for the individual litigant. Some who are troubled about the surveys of American asylum judges or Israeli parole judges may be drawn to metaphysical and religious inquiries about providence and chance. Advocates may learn a thing or two as well, although only the very bold or very desperate would openly confront a judge with an inquiry as to when he or she last had a snack. <laughs> Returning to my presentation at Baby Judge School, I next introduced the three the three short tests that constitute Shane Frederick's cognitive reflection test. And here is one of them for you to ponder. In a lake, there's a patch of lily pads. Every day, the patch doubles in size. If it takes 48 days for the patch to cover the entire lake, how long would it take for the patch to cover half the lake? I want to ask you to put up your hands. At the Baby Judge School, we have clickers whereby people can uh, anonymously put, put the answer in and we'll see, we see the, the result. The right answer is 47 days. But I'm sure that many of you either opted for 24 days or at least thought of 24 days before correcting yourself to 47 days. Perhaps some of you come up with a third, I don't know. This and the other two tests are chosen because they evoke an intuitive answer that is incorrect. They demonstrate the difference between intuitive and reflective thinking, or system one and system two thinking. System two thinking involves cognitive strain and a conscious shift from a casual, more intuitive mode to a more engaged and analytical mode. The whole issue is explored in a wonderful recent book by the Nobel Prize winner Daniel Kahneman, called Thinking Fast and Slow. When the cognitive reflection test was taken by 250 circuit judges in Florida, only 14% got the three questions right, a figure slightly lower than the 17% found from testing all subjects. Uh, I won't tell you the, the discrepancy between males and females uh, on the test. I'm probably in much, enough trouble already. The CRT, the Cognitive Reflection Test, offers many lessons for lawyers. The man who devised it found that adults perform poorly even though the questions are simple on reflection. He found that the more complex questions are better dealt with, that even those who responded correctly considered the intuitive answer first, and that those who selected the intuitive answers were more likely to see the questions as easy. Judges of all people ought at least to be exposed to the insights of this recent field of social psychology when assessing witnesses or directing juries. Cognitive reflection is the ability or disposition to resist reporting the response to a problem that first comes to mind. If we did resist this way all the time, we would quickly go mad. Fortunately for us, we make many quick stabs at answers that are usually correct and usually harmless if we get them wrong. Recognising someone in the street is an instance of this. But if a witness to a serious crime gets identification wrong, the consequences can, of course, be catastrophic. Intuitive answers are not necessarily wrong, but it helps us all, judges in particular, to understand a little about what is happening as our humanity and the humanity of witnesses and jurors intersect with legal principles in supposedly rational decision-making. We all need to get abreast of what are called cognitive heuristics. These are the mental shortcuts or procedures that everyone uses to find adequate but often imperfect answers to difficult questions. The word comes from the Greek word heuriskine to discover, 
that we encounter in Archimedes' exclamation, Eureka. A problem with heuristics is that they lie under our radar screen and they can create cognitive illusions of judgment. No one is immune from these illusions and there are many of them, some having particular relevance for lawyers. Let me give four examples. First, there is egocentric bias, the illusion that one's own views are mainstream. With the shift away from trial by jury, this is an increasing problem for the law. Many legal rules aim at a so-called objective standard, and the law calls in the services of fictional characters such as the reasonable person or the reasonable reader in determining negligence or defamation. In truth, the judges don't speak to a reasonable person, they speak to themselves, which is the only option available. Remember Cardozo's remark about us never seeing things with eyes except our own. My second heuristic illusion is hindsight bias. Kahneman tells us that the core of the illusion is that we believe we understand the past, which implies that the future also should be knowable. But in fact, we understand the past less than we believe we do. For courts, which are confined to the evidence, which necessarily skews the totality of information available, it's an added issue. The inability to reconstruct past beliefs will therefore inevitably cause us to underestimate the extent to which we are surprised by past events. Hindsight bias falsely prompts us to think that we knew it all along. Knowing about this human trait is a must for lawyers. Consider, for example, a case involving low-risk surgery in which an unpredictable accident occurred. The cognitive illusion will tend to drive both judge and jury to thinking that the operation was actually risky and that the doctor who ordered it should have known better. Hindsight bias also skews decision making about cause and effect. Justice Hayne in the High Court has particularly warned about the danger of determining negligence by reasoning backwards from the accident that happened. Third, there are biases known as framing biases. I suspect that good advocates know them instinctively and use them as lures when fishing for assent to an argument. The example I give the baby judges is drawn from parental custody cases. Should the husband get custody and should the wife lose custody pose the identical issue. But framing the issue one way or the other may divert a decision maker away from more objective evidence-based primary information. Fourth, and something of a favourite with me, are cognitive illusions described by the experts as involving priming and anchoring. Test after test has shown that if, for example, you divided a room into two groups, asking each group the age of Mahatma Gandhi when he died, the group that was first asked, was Gandhi more or less than 144 when he died? would come up with a significantly higher average age when answering the common non-leading question. This despite everybody recognising that 144 was an absurd figure. It seems likely that those in the 144 group answered the common question by reasoning away from the suggested figure of 144 and thus came up with a significantly higher numbers an instance of the anchoring phenomenon to which I shall now turn. By the way, Gandhi was 78 when he died. Anchoring is a form of priming that salesmen and negotiators know about, again by instinct if not training. When you pat yourself on the back for getting a used car salesman to give a discount of $300 on the asking price of $6,000, you may not realise as well as the psychologists that the starting offer of $6,000 anchored and skewed the whole negotiation process. Lawyers negotiating to settle litigation use this sales technique and hopefully aspects and dangers of it are taught about in courses now offered on alternative dispute resolution. Legislators have adopted anchoring when placing caps on damages or flaws on sentences for crime. Even though the legislation allows discretionary departure from the cap or the floor, the whole deliberative process moves 
away from the stipulated starting point and there's a significant drag effect as intended. Some of these psychological insights should also reinforce the importance of keeping prejudicially irrelevant information out of the ken of juries or even judges because there are studies that, that suggest that people just cannot put out of their mind uh, a thought that has been, a uh, prejudicial thought that has, has been put into it. The third and final area in which I shall touch upon the intersection of our frail humanity and our work as lawyers arises from my current involvement as chairman of the Tristan Jepson Memorial Foundation. The organisation honours a young graduate of this university who took his life due to depression that overcame him in his mid-twenties. The foundation seeks to inform lawyers about the prevalence and impacts of mental illness and to goad changes in working and living conditions. A recent survey revealed that one in five people, one in five, have a common, significant, diagnosable mental illness requiring treatment. This included depressive, anxiety or substance abuse disorders occurring sometime during the previous 12 months before the survey. We also know that 50% of people have a mental illness sometime in their life, yet 65% of people with a diagnosable mental disorder do not seek any help. For far too many, suicide is the response. It is the leading cause of death in people aged between 25 and 64. If these statistics do not shock, let me tell you that there are higher rates of psychiatric illness in the legal fraternity than most other professions, with particularly high levels of pathological anxiety, depression and alcohol abuse. Exactly why law is significantly more toxic than, say, medicine may have something to do with the sort of people who go into the legal profession. It's also a product of working conditions that are dangerous to psychological safety in many ways that are beginning to frighten managers of law firms and their insurers. In May 2010, the Law Council of Australia published a paper called Depression in the Legal Profession. It cites a 2007 survey conducted by Beyond Blue and Beaton Consulting, which found that, quote, the incidence of depressive symptoms among lawyers and law students had reached alarming levels. When compared to other professions, lawyers experienced the highest incidence of depressive symptoms. Respondents from law firms were also the most likely to use alcohol or other drugs to reduce or manage their symptomology. Dr. Robert Fisher is the head of the Department of Psychiatry and Psychological Services at St. Vincent's Private Clinic and Hospital. He's also a board member of the Jepson Foundation. Dr. Fisher is among the first to emphasise that psychiatric in illnesses can take many forms and have many causes. But he includes among the avoidable workplace-related stressors that he encounters very regularly in his own medical practice that treats many lawyers, the burden of excessive work demand, meaningless work and the sense of a treadmill existence, lack of acknowledgement of effort made, the sense of dog-eat-dog, dog, the sense of lack of support and encouragement, bullying, a culture of toughness with the need not to be perceived as weak or incapable or to be a whinger or complainer, and the pressures of billable time or profit per equity partner, or for judges, cases processed. Sadly, the common law remains slow to recognise an effective duty of care with respect to psychological safety in the workplace. There's a curious disconnect between paternalistic attitudes that protect workers standing near whirling machine blades and the law's relative insouciance about dangers to the psyche contributed to by many standard workplaces of modern times. The 2005 High Court decision of Cola and Cerebos suggests to me that we have a double standard about mental illness. Because despite the statistics I've already offered, the law regards mental illness as not generally foreseeable to employers. Only if an employer is put on actual notice of an individual's vulnerability 
will there be any serious duty to address psychological safety in the workplace? In my opinion, this is weird, unjust, and potentially very costly to society, especially for the legal profession. What would-be employees are likely to know about or to disclose their own psychological vulnerabilities? Most young lawyers will also be ignorant of the risks of the job they are seeking and naively trustful that its true working conditions have been disclosed. In formulating the common law in this manner, could this be a situation where the successful lawyers on our High Court have been affected by the cognitive illusion of viewing their own experience as survivors and thrivers as typical? We all need to get more serious about the mental welfare of lawyers at every stage of the profession. Much is happening, but much, much more needs to be done. The spate of work-related suicides within the profession is causing many to have a second look at what is tolerated, if not encouraged, in the back rooms of the law. If managers of law firms and courts continue to drag their feet, they will be goaded by rising insurance premiums, strategic tort actions, new laws addressing bullying in the workplace, and hopefully some effective trade union activity by those who represent young lawyers who are entering the pressure cooker of the legal profession. I hope that I've tonight provided some support for the idea that you can never take the man or woman out of the lawyer. Our humanity touches the choices we take at every turn. Our rationality and capacity to control circumstances are nowhere near as high as we would imagine. And we all need more effective protection against internal and external impulses to pursue professional go goals in ways that actually threaten our capacity to be the men and women we would wish to be and the welfare of those we love. Thank you.